church Wednesday night, seven o'clock, um, as we uh, begin to uh, meet again uh, for a little while here. Um, we're looking forward to what's uh, going to be happening uh, next Sunday, actually on Mother's Day. Sunday is going to be Mother's Day. Um, and so we as a family are looking forward to coming back uh, to worship. Yes, it will be a little different. Uh, so when you come, uh, just let you know, uh, we'll be not really fellowshipping in the foyer. Just go straight to the sanctuary on Sunday morning. Uh, we will have every other pew set aside, um, asking families. They can sit together, but then between families, the six feet distance. Um, and so we're just asking you guys to, to come together. But if you don't feel comfortable uh, this time with that, we understand that our worship service will still be live at 1015. Um, also, masks are optional, but yet, if you feel like you need to wear one, please feel free to do so. Others will be wearing them as well. Uh, but we want you just to come and, and enjoy the time together, uh, singing, giving praise to God, and really making a celebration uh, of worship. Uh, so Sunday, new schedule, 9 o'clock still, we'll do a, a adult Sunday school class, um, and then there will be a gap between after that is over to the 1015 live worship. Um, so you can watch the, the Bible study there and then come on to church and looking forward to it. We'll have nursery um, birth to three years old. And then we will also have a children's uh, sermon during the message time. They'll back and Cody will take some time with them. He's walking through the book of Judges. Uh, so anyway, we're looking forward to that uh, new new format on Sunday. Um, and right now we are on Wednesday nights. We're making our journey uh, through the book of Daniel. Uh, so my prayer is, as you have maybe even listened back to the other ones, uh, refreshing your memory uh, of where we have come from, from chapter one to chapter two, and now we're looking at chapter three. Uh, normally on Wednesday nights, we would be having a prayer connection at this time. Uh, we will start that back up in June, and I'll be letting our prayer team know and let you know if you want to join with us um, as we get to uh, share some prayer requests, but also to pray specifically for the message and for our church family break into groups, men and women, and we uh, spend time discipling one another and growing in our prayer times uh, separately as well. Uh, that will begin back, be again sometime in June. We'll let you know and we'll start that. Um, if when, when we do, we'll still be going through Daniel. So this Daniel study will be moved to a different day. Uh, we'll still do it live and then it will be posted um, up on the YouTube channel. You can get to that from the, the church website. So as we uh, begin tonight, uh, let's just take some time in prayer. Father, we do come before you today, uh, thanking you so much for our opportunity to uh, to worship, opportunity just to read your words uh, tonight and go through maybe a familiar passage in Daniel, uh, one that we have heard uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, I pray that it's as fresh as the first time we heard it. Uh, Father, be with our church family as we prepare to worship and uh, for those that are unable to be with us uh, as we gather back together, but they're still gathering uh, in their home and they're still worshiping. Uh, so, Father, we thank you for keeping us together. And I pray for um, for our entire community. And may we be a positive light in the midst of a very just a troubled time, a confused time, a time when uh, there's a lot of uncertainties still there. Uh, I pray that you would just supply uh, just graciously and allow testimonies come from this time as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Uh, if you have checked in with us today, uh, feel free to uh, comment on our page. Uh, if you have a question during our Bible study time about Daniel chapter three, or maybe about the previous chapter, uh, chapter two or even chapter one, uh, you can text that there in the comment and I'll try to look at it once in a while and fit that in at the end. Uh, or you can text me on my phone, uh, 618-969-0657. Uh, feel free. I've got that here. And you can send me a text uh, with a question. Uh, so I do want to make this as much uh, interaction as we can uh, with the limited of not being able to see your face. Um, but yet, I still want to minister to your heart. If you have any questions, feel free to dialogue during this time. Uh, chapter one of Daniel, real quick, just a key verse that will really set the tone for the rest of the book. Um, it really sets the pace for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, it sets the pace, Daniel chapter one, verse eight. We see they're in a new culture, they're in a new land, new ruler, and uh, but Daniel made up his mind. Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, 
they made up their mind that they would not defile themselves. They were going to honor God in all things. And so they put forth that challenge or that test to the king, just saying, we, we, we don't want to eat your meat. It is not according to our, our worship of God. Uh, we want to eat this instead. And we want to put it to a test. We want to allow God to show himself in a real powerful way. Um, and you will begin to read uh, uh, from verse 8 to the end of the chapter. You will see that it was observable. It was something that was obvious that God was blessing them. And when God blesses you, it's obvious. And when we pray, God, you know, have your hand and want you to work in an obvious way. Um, and he began to work in Daniel's life in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So that was chapter one. Uh, chapter two um, becomes this dream that the king has, and he puts the challenge to all the other uh, uh, magicians and sorcerers and magi, the Chaldeans, which were the intellectual of the land, saying, tell me my dream and then interpret it. They said, there's nobody that can do that except for the gods, God, something from outside of us. And they are recognizing that there is someone outside of us. Um, and so then we see that recognition there. Um, but he is now going to put them all to death. And of course, Daniel uh, is a member of this and he hears of what's happening in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as well. Um, they hear of this and Daniel says, I believe God can answer uh, the king's question. Um, and so he asked for permission for more time because he wasn't a part of the initial group to hear this request. So he asked for time. Time was granted. Um, in verse 17, Daniel went to his friends. He gathered them for a prayer time. Once again, the importance of praying, the importance of gathering together and spending time in prayer. And God revealed the mystery. There was praise given to God. Um, and then we see the, 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 the revelation of the dream. And uh, the revelation of the dream, as you look then at the statute that we'll look again in chapter 7 as well, we'll come back. Um, this statue of of the nations and how it will be crumbled by a stone in verse 34 it says a stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron clay and crushed them that is the significant we know that jesus is that stone he's the cornerstone um, and he will then crush and we begin to understand that will become a greater significance so um, if you want to just kind of highlight that or mark that when we get into the uh, more eschatological aspect of Daniel, the more futuristic, um, this, this stone becomes more clear in its understanding. Um, and so as Daniel interprets this and uh, tells the king, uh, we see a praise at the end in verse 46, uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and did homage to Daniel. And he, uh, in verse 47, and the king answered Daniel and said, surely your God is the God of gods and Lord, uh, of kings and revealer of mysteries. Uh, we see this, this praise, this emotional outburst of appreciation for Daniel, recognition of his God. Uh, but we said, man, remember last week, talk about the danger of an emotional response without a heart of repentance. The emotional response is there's a moment of praise, but then you go back to your old lifestyle. Nothing ever changed. Um, he was thankful for that moment, uh, but that was the end of it because we go into chapter three and he has long forgotten God at all. And uh, so that's the danger of the emotional response. As a matter of fact, you not only will see that here, you'll see at the end of our study today, the end of chapter three, you have another emotional response, but no change of heart. When there is no repentance of the heart, there is no salvation. We just made an emotional response. In our worship time, when we come together, that's always the, the danger. Um, and we want to pray for repentant hearts, and we never want to forget about the uh, the importance of repenting of sin, acknowledging a sin, acknowledging that we have sinned against God. We have uh, we agree with God's definition of sin, and we agree that we have wronged Him, and uh, we're we're in need of His forgiveness. We're in need of His salvation. That's repentance. It comes because God comes to us. God convicts us. God uh, addresses that in our lives through the Holy Spirit, through the word, through the life and ministry of Jesus. Um, so we got to understand the importance of repentance, importance of a confession of faith, and then a life of faith, uh, living. What we've been talking about Sunday morning is the power of the resurrection, living in that power. Um, so let's take a look now at Daniel chapter 3. 
Uh, matter of fact, um, you'll probably recognize what we're going to talk about tonight because this was the first sermon of the year uh, back in January, uh, 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 January 3rd, the first Sunday of 2020. We went over Daniel chapter 3. Uh, one of the key words that we focus on here at New Life is worship, and this really is about a worship. Um, so we get to kind of review that message again, uh, expounding upon the call to worship. Uh, when we talk about worship, we're talking about celebrating worship, about being faithfully worshiping God, steadfast in our worship. Um, and you'll see that coming out of chapter 1, verse 8. They made a commitment. They weren't going to defile. It prepared Daniel for the dream. It's now going to prepare them as they're being steadfast, they're being faithful. We're going to see another narrative event that happens that then puts uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego uh, in the hot seat, if you would. Uh, we're going to kind of put them at center stage. Uh, let's take a quick look at this chapter as a narrative. Um, as we look at the narrative, you will see verses one through eight. Uh, this is uh, King Nebuchadnezzar. Remember in chapter two, verse 46, he started making the praise for Daniel, verse 47, the praise of God. But look in chapter three, verse one, Nebuchadnezzar, the king made an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits with its six cubits uh, width and uh, set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word in the assembly of, of the satraps, the, the perfects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the providence to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar, the king, had set up. So we have, a, we, we have one who makes an emotional response. God, man, I'm grateful that you answered uh, my dream, but I'm not going to listen to you. I'm not going to do anything you say. As a matter of fact, I'm going to set up a golden image in my image, and I want people to worship me. And that's verses one through seven. Um, he he has failed to to worship God, but now he's setting up himself to be God. Um, in verses eight through twelve, we have then the officials who uh, are jealous of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they are not uh, Babylon's Babylonians. They are not Chaldeans. Um, they are Hebrews. They are now Jew. They're from Judea. They're from, they're, 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 they are the Jews. And they don't like them now infiltrating because the end of chapter two, remember, uh, Daniel was set in a place of position and he asked that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also serve in the administration of the king. And these are being jealous of what uh, God is blessing. And now they are wanting to attack the Jews and, and specifically Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because they would not bow down to uh, the king's image. Well, verses 13 through 18, the king then uh, is enraged, angry, and he's giving them the opportunity uh, to basically say, we're sorry, king, we're going to bow down to you. Uh, well, verses 19 through 27, uh, the king is furious. He is then ordering the furnace to be heated seven times hotter than ever before, um, and, set, and the soldiers are tying them up and throwing them into the fiery furnace. Interestingly, when they threw them in, uh, the heat was so hot, it actually killed the, the soldiers that had been throwing them in as well. Um, it consumed them. And so we have this, um, this, uh, uh, this fire that is, is raging and now throwing them in there uh, versus uh, then verses 28. Uh, through the end of the chapter, we have this praise. Once again, the king praises God for delivering them, for um, saving them. He is he is just amazed at all that had taken place. Um, and he's saying there's no other God that can save uh, like him, like he did to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, so we ask the question. What do we learn from that? What do we what, what do we pull away from this narrative? And there's probably uh, several application points that we could glean from, but we're we're going to kind of focus in on this worship, um, knowing that it was a key for it's a key phrase for us here at New Life, and so I believe that God maybe wants at this time to reiterate as we're coming back to worship on Mother's Day the purpose of worship. Um, God knows what He's doing. Even when it seems like things are in, in chaotic state, um, timeliness of God's word and how he brings us back to his word 
uh, from January 3rd, start the year with this. And now we've had this eight week time where we haven't been together. Now we're coming back. What does he want to emphasize? Worship. So I really believe God has something to say to us right here, right now. And uh, we're going to pull from this once again, um, the attitude of worship that God is longing for uh, from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. What is it? Well, exclusive. Um, exclusive worship. Uh, this is that, that very beginning in, in Daniel 1.8 where we will not defile our God. We're not going to defile ourselves. We're not going to leave God. We're not going to throw God out now just because all of a sudden our circumstances aren't the way we want them to be, that somehow we're going to get rid of God. No, we, we, are, we are exclusively worshiping God. God, one God, Yahweh. In contrast, uh, Babylon had eight, about seven gods. Um, they had a, a called the ruler of the, the oceans. Um, we have um, um, also uh, gods of the gods of, of the sky, gods of wisdom, arts, crafts. We we have Murdoch, who was called the wisest of the gods, um, gods of the air between the earth and sky. Uh, we have the goddess of love and war. Um, and so there, there were there were just a number of different gods. In contrast, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we worship one God. Um, you see that. In, in verse 12, um, there were certain Jews whom you have appointed over the administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image which you have set up. They're not going to bow down. They're exclusively worshiping their God. Um, and so that was the foundation of the, the Jews coming out of, out of captivity when they were it committed all kinds of idolatry. And now they're realizing how much they had sinned against God, and they are now steadfast. They are not going to worship any other God. The first two commandments God gave them in the wilderness. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall make no idols. And so here we have God saying, look, I, I want you to exclusively worship me. God demanded that kind of worship. Um, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? If you could put all the commandments and put them in place and put them in order, what's the great, what's the number one commandment? What is it? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. Exclusive. Omitting anything else from consideration. Shutting all others out. Worship belongs to God and God alone, for there are no other gods. Anything else we call a God made it has no authority has no power has no action whatsoever and so we see that god is demanding this that we we, we worship him and him alone exclusively but we also do it honorably um, look at verse 17 um, as you as you read through there you will find the king is very upset um, and he is now giving them an opportunity to bow down again um, Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. Uh, as, as they are being put to the test, they, they're doing it honorably. O king, they're responding with respect. They're not... They're not Dis, disregarding who, who Nebuchadnezzar is. He is the king. He is the one in authority. He said, oh, king, uh, we want you to know that we recognize your authority. We recognize your rule. Um, but there is a point where you now have crossed over into our worship, and we can't worship any other god but Yahweh. We will not worship. But they do it honorably. Um, and when the king threatened, um, uh, you know, they said that uh, then, then what God will be able to ready? The king then answered and said, well, then what God will be able to uh, to rescue you? Um, and and they, they they defend God. They, they, they give forth um, this message in verse 15. Kind of back up just a little bit um, in verse 15. Um, now, if, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the, um, and all of these instruments that are named there, uh, fall down and worship the image I have made very well. 
But if you do not worship, uh, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? He says, really, I mean, think about it. I am sole authority. Um, but, but they said to him, you know, we don't need to defend ourselves on this matter. We don't need to make any other statement in verse 16. We don't need to give you an answer concerning this. Um, what were they saying in that? Well, they knew that God could act on their behalf. They understood that. Um, and when, the, when, 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 when people undermine the importance of God's power, they panic. And they were not in any panic mode. They were honorably recognizing who the king was, but they also understood who God was and they were servants of the God most high. And so they were honorably saying, look, we cannot surrender to you in this matter. This matter belongs to God and God alone. Um, and there weren't any panic at all. Uh, when they said that our God's able to deliver us from the fiery furnace in verse 17, they're saying that his power is great. It is far greater than your furnace. You may have a great furnace and you can heat it up seven times hotter. It doesn't matter, King. Our God is greater than the blazing fire. And then they said that our God will deliver us out of your hand. God is greater than the greatest king of this world. Um, don't be afraid of kings and leaders and rulers. Honor them. You do it honorably. But you need to honor God more importantly. Follow him um, and, and, and trust God to be greater than the circumstance, greater than the, the supposedly punishment of a fiery furnace. But, but how did they know they could trust God? I want you to think about this for a moment. They made a huge statement that we know that God will defend us. Where did that come from? When you make a statement of trust in God, where does it come from? Well, if you look at their own lives, how God has already taken care of them back in chapter one, he brought them through the test and, and they have come out wiser and stronger. God says, I'm going to take care of you even when you're outside of Jerusalem. When you're in a faraway land, I'm still there. So we know their, their immediate history has already shown that God will take care of them. But you go back in even, even farther than that and knowing the history of how God was taking care of them and the covenants, we then can look at God's word historically and say, God has historically taken care of God's people. Historically, look at the word of God. This is a real event. Daniel's not made up. And so we're not telling a fairy tale and trying to spin something uh, to, to become of a, a positive word. We're talking about true fact of true individuals trusting God and God is going to deliver. So they knew that based on their personal experience, what they have just been through, but also even beyond that, the historical aspect of faith. And we now have historical aspect of faith and we've got personal experiences and so in our worship uh, we have confidence in god we do it honorably we, we do it we we do it in 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 such a way that shows genuine trust in god and we also do it in such a way that we want to uh, be a positive light they are a positive light to king nebuchadnezzar and so they have this honorable attitude well the third thing is it's unconditional it's unconditional. We have to do this. We can't serve your other gods. It's unconditional. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego declared, even if God does not do what we believe he can do, we are still going to worship him. We are not going to serve any other gods. I want you to think about that. Verse 18, look at that. Even if he does not, even if we are thrown in the fire, and we die. We are not going to serve your gods. Unconditional. How many times do we put conditions on this? God, if you deliver us before we get into the furnace, uh, we put things on this. But, but God's desire is unconditional, that we don't put God in a box. And it's my prayer that as we worship, we worship God no matter what. I mean, listen to the convictions. They're not putting any parameters. They know that God can. 
they know that he can. He can. He can heal. He can take care of this whole situation. Uh, but he's not bound by that, by what he can do. He is going to bring out his will, his way to reach Nebuchadnezzar, to demonstrate the, his power. Uh, but it's not limited by just saving them from a fiery furnace. Think about this. That phrase, but even if he does not, implies that they are not going to give up on God. They're not going to give up, even when it seems like he's unresponsive, like God's not there. How many times have we felt God's not here? How many times have you felt that? And then you just walk away from God. They said, no, we're going to worship God regardless because we know who he is. It's based on fact. Now, the fact engages our feelings, but it's not about just the feelings. We've already seen that in Nebuchadnezzar's life. If we base it solely on our feelings, we're always pushed and pulled and never make a true commitment. So even if he does not imply, so they're not going to give up on God. They're not going to turn their back on him because God is faithful. He's a true God. They're not going to replace him with anything else. They're not going to replace him with a weaker God. Um, and so we see that that phrase is huge. Second, the phrase implies that their worship of God is not dependent on a positive, miraculous act. It's not based on that. It's based on who he is. He's a loving father. And worship is simply giving God honor. And the third thing we look at that in there is that it, it implies a surrender to God's will. I'm surrendering my will which I don't want to die in a furnace, but I'm going to surrender that. God, if that's what you have in store, then I will go through that. Now, that is very difficult for us to, to, to understand. That's why I think you, you look back at Daniel chapter 1. It sets foundation. Your foundation of what's happened, the commitments that you have made, prepare you for a fiery furnace. If, if you're wavering right now in, in your faith, you're unsure of commitments you've made to him, I'd, I'll, I'll be honest, you're already in a fiery furnace. Um, God wants to secure you for, for something even greater, greater difficulties ahead. God's going to prepare you for that. There, there's no easy way of living this life. But God says, if you'll follow me, I'll take care of you. I'll protect you, even in the midst of a fiery furnace. And so it implies total surrender to God's will. Remember, the will of the father was to allow his son to die for our sins. That was his cup. Remember, in the Gospels, when Jesus was talking to, to Peter, James, and John, they're asking uh, to follow and to sit by his right hand. He says, can you drink the cup that I'm about to drink? Or can you drink the cup God's going to give you? You have a cup. And are you willing to, can, are you ready for this? Are you ready to surrender your will? I really believe in the end of John's gospel uh, when they're out fishing and Jesus is making the breakfast and they realize who it is. And Peter gets out. And he runs in there. Um, and we see that conversation about, do you love me? Do you truly love me? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. That's the cup. Do you love me? Do you truly love him? And this was a this was a challenge for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but they, they'd already established that. And they said, yeah, we love him. And we, we're going to serve him, even if he doesn't save us from this fiery furnace. Well, the last thing that we want to, to see here tonight is the sacrificial uh, aspect of worship. The sacrificial aspect of worship um, in, in verse... Uh, 20, um, he commanded the certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace, blazing fire. And these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and all their other clothes were cast in the midst of the fire, in the blazing fire. And for this reason, because the king's command was urgent, the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flames uh, of fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the blazing, of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. In verse 24, and the Nebuchadnezzar, the king, was astonished, and he stood up in haste. He says to his, his high officials, 
Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, certainly, O king. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance uh, of the fourth is like the son of the gods. I want you to see the sacrifice in their worship. As a result of their resistance to the, the decree of the king, it meant losing their lives to be thrown into the blazing furnace. And to fully understand that, the men, once again, the men that threw them into the furnace, they were slew, they were killed by the heat of the furnace. Understand that this was a real life moment. They were going to be throwing into a fire. Our worship of God demands that we do not compromise the worship of God for the sake of peaceful relationships, personal comfort, or personal agendas. Sacrifice. Maybe this past eight weeks has been the greatest sacrifice in your worship, realizing that we couldn't come together. And it wasn't just about the churches not coming. It wasn't a, a government saying churches are not to worship. It was our, our, our entire community, our entire society as a nation, um, for this one purpose, for health, to, to get a handle on this. But still, it was the idea that we're not allowed to come to worship. That was difficult to handle. So what did you do? Did you take worship serious in your homes? That, that's got to be tough. Now, I came here every Sunday morning. Our praise team was here. And so we still had that, that idea of gathering together. Uh, to worship. Cody was here. We did Bible study. We we had fellowship here with just a few of us. But to worship in our homes and taking away that dynamic of being together, uh, maybe more, maybe it was too comfortable. The coffee and just the kind of kickback and I can just observe. I mean, how, have you, how many of you actually sang at home? Just kind of curious. Uh, uh, for those of you that are watching us uh, live, let me know. Hey, yeah, we actually sang. We'd love to hear how that, how the home experience went. But I mean, it was a sacrifice. I never had the sacrifice of a furnace, but here we had the sacrifice of not coming together. But our worship of the true God demands that we don't compromise. We're still going to worship, even if we're not together. We're still going to worship. We should not compromise the worship of God for the sake of peaceful relationship, just to a bit make it peace with the king. God already said that he came not to bring peace, but to bring conflict. I want you to know that the gospel divides. Matthew chapter 10, 34 through 37. Uh, the gospel divides us. It's going gonna, it's gonna to divide families because not everyone will welcome God. Not everyone's going to bow down to God. And so forth, there's going to be a natural division. But we're not to be moved by that. We are not to compromise our personal agendas. Um, we are to allow God to set the agenda of our heart. Allow God to bring change in our worship. Allow God to mature us, to grow us, uh, to, to develop us as true worshipers of God. How do we know that our personal agenda is in the way? How do you know that? It's when everything revolves around you. I don't like this. They're not doing it my way. Why can't we have it this way? When we always are putting that forth. We have to, to really check ourselves, uh, check our hearts, and allow God to set the, the, the pace, allow God to set the direction. Now, the Chaldeans, these were the intellects. This was the southern part of Babylon, these Chaldeans. They compromised the worship of God for the sake of their security and their employment. They said, hey, these guys over here, they're not worshiping your God. Hey, 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 they're, they're, all, they're all about, hey, let's, let's keep the king happy. And we realize that God's not about comfortable. God's about worship. And genuine worship of God sometimes demands a willingness to give our lives. Are we willing to do that? It doesn't always always lead to that but we have to know be okay with that 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 extent of sacrifice we give the sacrifice of praise we sing that praise song every once in a while 
Now think about the sacrifices we make to worship together. On an average Sunday, we probably don't have that big of a sacrifice. Maybe this past eight weeks taught us about true sacrifice. But God promises us that he will bless us when he sees a heart that gives worship exclusively to him, honorable, unconditional, and sacrificial. What did God do? Well, he, he, he intervened. He stepped in. He stepped in. You can notice what he said. We, I thought I threw three men in there, King Nebuchadnezzar said. But why are there four? And this fourth one is I, the sons of God. God stepped in. God delivered. Could it be that we don't see those types of miracles because we're not readily worshiping him with a sacrificial heart? I mean, I want you to think about that. They made a commitment. We're, we're going to worship God regardless of whether or not he's going to save us from this furnace. We realize that's where we're headed, and we're okay with that. We're going to worship God through all of that. And they, they held to that. And God intervened. Just maybe we don't see God in a miraculous way because we're not willing to go to a fire. We're not willing to commit. We are what we call conditional worshipers. When God says, I want unconditional, we're conditional. We don't really make sacrifices when it comes to worship. So God intervened. God took care of them. We also see, we can see Philippians chapter 2 verses 10 through 11 come to light here in this passage where Philippians 2 talks about the name of Jesus. Every knee will bow of those who are in heaven, those who are on earth and under the earth. Every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord uh, to the glory of God the Father. Now we know this is uh, before Christ's ministry. I believe that Jesus is that fourth person in that fiery furnace. Um, and so I really believe this is this we see a foreshadowing of what Paul's going to tell us in Philippians chapter two in the New Testament, that every knee will bow. King Nebuchadnezzar is going to have a God moment. How many God moments do you have to have before you give your life to Christ? He's going to have his second God or probably his third God moment. First God moment was in chapter one, seeing the wisdom of God in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in Daniel's life. Chapter chapter two his second god moment was daniel giving god praise for the interpretation for the giving of the dream and the interpretation here is divine moment number three where he sees the, the sees god the son of gods right there in the midst of that fire notice what he says he responded in verse 28 blessed be the god of shadrach meshach and abednego who has sent his angel to deliver his servants and put trust in him um, violating the king's command, yielding up their bodies as not to serve or worship any, any God except their own God. Therefore, I make a decree that any people, nation, tongue, that speaks anything uh, offensive against God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb to limb and their houses reduced to rubbish, a rubbish heap, inasmuch there is no God who is able to deliver in this way. And then the king Cause Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Once again, we see an emotional response. We don't hear a repentant heart. We just see uh, one who is really humbled, realizing that, yeah, my God can't, my statue could not do that. Uh, it's the recognition of God, but not a true life given to God. Uh, but we, we do see divine exaltation. We see this. Um, clearly, as God stepping in, he is saying, I will be praised. In our worship, he will be praised. He is the focus. He is what drives us. He sets the pattern for our worship. Allow your heart to truly worship him. Allow him to, to move you. Allow him to uh, be expressive in your worship. Uh, but more importantly, allow it to be a fact of a relationship with him that drives your emotion. Don't let it just be an emotional response. That will not lead to a honest confession. Honest confession is from the heart based on a confession of sin and a confession that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life and you will worship him exclusively, honorably, unconditionally, and sacrificially. So as we think about our worship, what's our attitude toward worship? 
How do you describe your worship of God? What quality do you need to work on the most? Of these we looked at, which one is one that say, God, I really need to, God, you need to work, work that out in my life. And what do other people say about your worship of God? Because worship is the overflow of a saved relationship through Jesus Christ. So my, my challenge to you tonight is that you, you uh, prepare your heart for worship. As we at New Life will be gathering together, and if you feel comfortable coming, we understand uh, for health reasons, those that are 65 and older, pre-existing conditions, stuff that you're struggling with, uh, we understand that. You can't gather yet. That's okay. We'll be live stream. We still want you to join with us. But if you could come, come. And uh, we'll spread out. Uh, and we'll have a great time of, of fellowship again, seeing each other face to face and honoring our moms and, and uh, really learning uh, from them. And what does God's word have to say to us about um, honoring uh, our mothers? Um, and so we want our worship to over, be overflow with our relationship with Christ. So let's join together. Uh, so you, you pray with me right now. Father, I just come before you uh, saying thank you uh, for our time uh, in the book of Daniel. Um, and may our worship be, um, be genuine. It may be real. And may Daniel chapter 3 uh, be, a, be a foundation of our worship, that we will worship you exclusively, honorably, unconditionally, and sacrificially. Father, I thank you for this time with our church family. And I pray that as they're listening live or they'll listen later on tonight or on the YouTube channel later, um, that, Father, that you will speak to our hearts. You challenged us with this passage in January. And now you're coming back to us right now to say, hey, let's get worship right. I pray our hearts are in perfect order with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for listening. I look forward to seeing you Sunday. If you have any questions, uh, feel free to call the church, email us, newlifegreencastle at gmail.com. Um, and if you have any questions about coming on Sunday, uh, I will give a update on the, the um, how things have been handled since you've been out. Um, on Friday, probably afternoon, we'll do a Facebook Live again and uh, get you ready for worship and uh, preparation as we pray over the sanctuary uh, in preparation for Sunday. So you have a great evening and uh, see you on Sunday.